Thanks very much, Don. It's great to see friends from the School for Workers here, as well as uh, thank you to the Haven Center and Patrick for uh, your work in putting this together. Uh, this is my first time to this campus, first time to Madison, so it's a, a big treat to see all of you and to uh, learn about some of the exciting work that's going on uh, in this part of the country. Um, to give you a little more about my background as I approach this topic of organizing immigrant workers and building a new labor movement for the new working class, um, most of my life has been very much focused on issues impacting immigrant workers. Um, my beginnings in the labor movement were as a boycott organizer for the United Farm Workers of America under the leadership of Cesar Chavez. And I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I'm third generation Chinese American. Um, and my connection with the farm workers was tangential because I didn't come from a family of farm workers. I grew up in the big city, had never been on a farm, let alone knew what the living conditions were for farm workers in the fields of California. <coughs> but like thousands and thousands of other students in that period, we were attracted to the United Farm Workers of America because it represented a movement for social justice, that um, the farm workers emerged as a conscience of this nation. Or how could it be that in the wealthiest country in the world, that those who plant and pick the fruits and vegetables that we eat every day of our lives are paid poverty wages, are poisoned by pesticides in the field, and even to this day are being subjected to inhumane conditions where there are deaths due to heat stroke in the Central Valley of California that are completely preventable. And yet, because the growers choose not to provide shade, not to provide drinking water, you still have deaths to these days in the fields of California. So my work in high school and in college with the United Farm Workers of America has really stuck with me throughout my life and throughout my career. And the lessons that I learned from the farm worker movement was the power of collective action. That here you had a group of immigrant workers, many who had no formal education, many who were undocumented, um, and yet when they organized together and when they stood together, they were able to take on some of the most powerful corporate interests in this country and agribusiness in the state of California, and were able to win. And so, um, that really was my first introduction to the labor movement, to the importance of developing labor community partnerships, the importance of understanding the role of community organizing and building a broader vision for the labor movement. It taught me about the importance of organizing immigrant workers and the power of collective action. And it also taught me about the power of nonviolence and the um, the role that nonviolence has played throughout the generations, both in terms of inspiring the civil rights movement in this country that challenged the apartheid-like system that we had in the South and in other parts of the country, that uh, led to a successful national great boycott and extracted economic hardship on some of the wealthiest growers and wealthiest agribusiness corporations in America, and that continues to be um, a powerful force in making change both within the United States and throughout the world. So um, as Don indicated, I worked as staff attorney for the Service Employees International Union in Los Angeles during a period of tremendous transformation of the <coughs> LA labor movement. when. Uh, we were just beginning the Justice for Janitors organizing campaign that succeeded in reorganizing the janitorial industry in Los Angeles. When we were just at the beginning stages of organizing home care workers in Los Angeles that resulted in the single largest union victory that this country has seen in the last 50 years when 74,000 home care workers were successfully unionized back in 1999 and today, where there are 250,000 unionized home care workers in the state of California, 
represented by both the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees and by the Service Employees International Union. 250,000 workers. The vast majority are women, people of color, and large numbers of immigrants, and all low-wage workers. So uh, in seeing the successful organizing of the janitors and seeing the successful organizing of the home care workers, in California, some of the most dynamic and successful organizing campaigns have been led by immigrant workers. And um, I see that when unions invest the time, energy, and resources to organize immigrant workers, that they have been remarkably successful. And the unfortunate reality is that there is still tremendous divisions within the American labor movement in terms of our approach to organizing and to our openness and willingness to organize the new working class. I just uh, <coughs> participated in the national AFL-CIO convention, which was hosted in Los Angeles two weeks ago. And it was a very exciting uh, convention. It was an uh, amazing gathering. The last time that we had hosted the AFL-CIO convention in Los Angeles was 14 years ago, back in 1999. And at that point, I was working very closely with the former leader of the Los Angeles labor movement, a man by the name of Miguel Contreras. He was the first Latino, he was the first person of color to lead the Los Angeles labor movement. And during the time that he was head of the LA labor movement for close to 10 years, we saw huge changes take place within the culture of unions in Los Angeles, and in particular with their attitude and with their commitment to organizing immigrant workers. So back in 1999, I worked with Miguel Contreras to organize a huge march that led off the AFL-CIO convention. And so we gathered hundreds and hundreds of newly organized workers of Los Angeles. The vast majority were people of color, many women, many immigrants, many young workers. And we marched into the convention hall at the beginning of the AFL-CIO convention back in 99, 1999. And it was a powerful sight because you had hundreds of workers with their union t-shirts, with their banners, with their signs, marching through the AFL-CIO convention, and then jumping up on stage to uh, be welcomed and to be celebrated by the uh, AFL-CIO convention in Los Angeles. And there was such a dramatic and sharp contrast between the leadership of the American labor movement that was on stage, that was predominantly white, predominantly almost all male, predominantly older, and the vision of the new working class jumping up on stage, joining them, chanting and, and shouting and uh, celebrating these recent organizing victories. And that image really stuck with me because at the very same convention back in 1999, when the National Day Labor Organizing Network sent a solidarity delegation down to uh, celebrate with the AFL-CIO, they were uh, physically evicted from the convention by union members who blamed the day laborers for undermining union jobs in the construction industry. And so they were physically pushed out and ejected from the convention floor back in 1999. So um, back in 1999, there was still tremendous debate within the American labor movement on what should our approach be with regard to immigrant workers and what are we going to do with the millions and millions of undocumented immigrant workers who are working and living within this country. And so uh, key unions brought this debate to the floor of the AFL-CIO convention back in 99 and demanded a change in policy. Uh, the AFL-CIO at one point had been uh, quite hostile to immigrant workers and had embraced policies that contributed to the exploitation and abuse of immigrant workers. 
It was the AFL-CIO that was one of the organizations at the forefront of demanding employer sanctions, where there would be civil and criminal penalties against employers for knowingly hiring undocumented immigrants. The reality is that in the 27 years that employer sanctions has been the law of the land, employers are virtually never punished for hiring undocumented immigrants. But instead, it's the immigrants themselves who have been punished who have been driven further underground in the underground economy, and who have been subjected to horrendous exploitation and abuse at the hands of unscrupulous employers who refuse to uh, pay them minimum wage, who refuse to respect basic labor laws that are afforded all workers in this country regardless of their status. So that debate unfurled back in 1999 at the FLCIO convention. And the FOCIO did a 180 degree turn back in 1999 and called for legalization of undocumented immigrants throughout the country, called for the uh, aggressive organizing of immigrant workers, and signaled a new day of partnerships between labor unions and immigrant communities. And I remember in the year 2000 working with Miguel Contreras to organize a town hall meeting to announce to the immigrant workers of Los Angeles the new policy of the AFL-CIO. So we booked the Los Angeles sports arena, the biggest venue that we could find. It seats 16,000 people. And we were a little nervous because we weren't sure how many people were going to come out. So as we were planning for this huge town hall with immigrant workers, we thought, well, maybe we should just rope off the upper tiers and we'll just keep people on the floor and that'll look full even if we can't fill the whole place with 16,000 people. So in June of the year 2000, 20,000 people came out to uh, this town hall meeting with the top leadership of the American labor movement, with immigrant rights organizations, with faith-based groups to celebrate the change in policy of the AFL-CIO. Thousands could not get in because we had reached capacity at 16,000. And yet, the thousands who couldn't get in, they stayed, and they staged a solidarity march around the sports arena. Uh, and the energy in that room was so powerful. It was like being at a rock concert, but there was no rock band performing. <laughs> People were chanting and screaming and shouting and you know, waving banners. Uh, because immigrant workers understood the significance of the change in policy of the FLCIO understood that for the American labor movement to stand with them and to support them and to defend them would make a huge difference in pursuing meaningful immigration reform. So uh, that was a moment back in the year um, 2000 of tremendous hope for comprehensive immigration reform. Unfortunately, on 9-11, the very next year, uh, the national movement to demand a path to citizenship and legalization for the millions and millions of documented immigrants took a huge hit. And from 9-11 forward, any discussion of immigration was tied to a discussion about terrorism. Immigrants became terrorists, and anything that addressed immigration addressed issues of we need to secure our borders from the threats from foreigners. So uh, this was really a complete transformation of what had gone on and a complete distortion of the reality of the immigrant experience uh, in this country. But uh, the complete national debate was derailed after 9-11. Um, in 2006, the largest uh, pro-immigrant rights demonstrations in the nation's history took place all over the country. Millions and millions of immigrant workers marched in the streets in the spring of 2006. On May 1st, International Workers' Day 2006, the largest single May Day in our country's history took place. In the city of Los Angeles, we had over one million immigrant workers marching in the street in May 1st, 2006. This was an extraordinary sight. 
I'm the director of the UCLA Labor Center. We have one office on the UCLA campus. We also have an outreach office in downtown Los Angeles. And our outreach office became May Day Central in preparing for that May 1st, 2006 march. All of the legal observers met in our offices. All of the monitors met. All of the, a lot of the banner making was taking place, a lot of the media. And um, our office is located right across the street from MacArthur Park, which um, is in central Los Angeles. The march route began at MacArthur Park and went down Wilshire Boulevard for four and a half miles. And uh, the entire street was blocked off. And there was a sea of humanity from building to building. And everybody was wearing white that day on May 1st, 2006. So you had hundreds of thousands of people marching for four and a half miles down Wilshire Boulevard. And it was a, just a joyous celebration where uh, it was the closest thing to a general strike that the city of Los Angeles has seen since the 1930s. And uh, it was an amazing display of solidarity. By the time the marchers arrived four and a half miles down the road <coughs> to the rally site, many of the marchers had not yet even left MacArthur Park. So there was a, a seamless line of this <coughs> huge mass mobilization, the sea of humanity that extended over four and a half miles. Um, so, I share with you the May Day 2006 because what's very interesting is that the very first May Day in this country occurred back in 1886 in Chicago, Illinois. A lot of times my students at UCLA will ask, where did May Day come from? And they'll say, oh, it must have come from Russia or Cuba or <laughs> China. And many of my students at UCLA don't realize that actually this is a working class holiday, that the very first May Day was um, launched in Chicago, Illinois, and that many of the leaders of the very first May Day back in 1886 were immigrants. <coughs> they were immigrants from Poland and from Italy and from Ireland and from uh, Russia. Uh, and What's interesting is that it took 120 years for the spirit of May Day to come back to the U.S. working class. And it was brought back by immigrant workers. But these immigrant workers are no longer mainly from Europe. These immigrant workers are from Mexico and El Salvador and from Colombia and from the Philippines and from the Caribbean and from India and from China. And so, the uh, composition of the immigrant workforce has changed, but in many ways, it reflects the changing nature of the working class and that the very early unions, many of which were built by immigrant labor, and today we see tremendous potential once again for a revitalized labor movement that um, in many parts of the country will be led by the new working class and the new immigrant workforce. In uh, my hometown of Los Angeles, we have huge major industries where the vast majority of the workforce are immigrants. And if you look at the last 20 years of successful organizing, the majority of the vast majority of the successful organizing campaigns have been led by immigrant workers. So I wanted to share a uh, short video on one particular immigrant worker organizing campaign that we at the UCLA Labor Center are quite proud of. Um, we um, have been doing a lot of support work around immigrant worker organizing for many, many years. Uh, the UCLA Labor Center launched the very first Spanish language union leadership school. I'm, I'm thrilled that the School for Workers has brought some of their Leadership Institute uh, members here today. Um, but we in Los Angeles also run a whole series of union leadership schools to develop and train a new generation of um, union activists and union leaders. 
And in Los Angeles, because so many of the emerging leaders came from the Justice for Janitors campaign, and from the hotel workers, and from the garment workers, and from the, um, uh, the um, Port Truckers organizing campaign, from the recycling organizing campaign, that uh, many of these workers spoke Spanish. And so we organized the very first Spanish language union leadership school that was uh, conducted entirely in Spanish. And um, it was an amazing gathering to bring together uh, immigrant workers from many different unions, from many different campaigns, who could share story, stories with one another, learn from each other, and who could uh, talk about um, the <coughs> impact of the growing alliance between unions and immigrant communities of Los Angeles. So um, at the UCLA Labor Center, we teach classes at UCLA. Many of our classes involve contemporary labor issues, and many of our classes involve some form of research or service learning in the broader community. So we taught a class on issues of uh, immigrant workers of Los Angeles, and we actually had a group project where our students went out to the car wash industry in Los Angeles and interviewed workers to document the conditions that they confront on the job. So it was a great research project. We sent out all these teams of students. And uh, for those of you who know Los Angeles, Los Angeles is a huge car culture. Uh, nobody walks in Los Angeles. Everybody's in their cars. And everybody has a local car wash. Everybody you know, takes care of their cars, and they, they have a local car wash. And so there are car washes all over Los Angeles. There are hundreds of car washes over, all over Los Angeles. And so this was not a difficult thing for us to identify, find, and locate these car washes and to send our students out, many of whom were bilingual Spanish, to document issues involving wages, working conditions, tips, uh, employment practices at these car washes. And so when we got all this data back, we were appalled. We were shocked at the level of exploitation and abuse at these car washes throughout Los Angeles. We found out that it was very common for workers to work 10, 12-hour shifts and make $40 for the day's work under the table. $40 for 10 to 12-hour shifts. What's worse is that many workers in a so-called trainee category would work months and months with no wages whatsoever. And they would only get tips for the people that would, at the end of the, at the, end of the um, uh, car wash line, frequently clients would give a tip. And that's all they lived off of. So um, we documented this horrendous abuse within the car wash industry. We presented this information before the California State Legislature. Uh, some of our friends in the California State Legislature authored new legislation to strengthen enforcement of uh, working conditions in the car wash industry. We had a resolution passed before the Los Angeles City Council to clean up the, um, the inhumane working conditions and uh, wages and labor standards within the car wash industry. And as we launched this campaign, uh, we began outreaching to various unions who might be interested in developing an organizing campaign involving car wash workers. As it turns out, we partnered with the National AFL-CIO, and the United Steelworkers of America bought on and said, said, this is something that we would like to invest our time, energy, and resources to support this organizing campaign of car wash workers. And in the last year, we have secured five union victories in Los Angeles, the very first five car washes in the country that have been unionized. And currently, there are campaigns to organize car wash workers in Chicago and in New York. So I wanted to share with you this short clip that was put out by Brave New Films. It's a, um, um, they're an LA-based documentary film company. And they did this on a pro bono basis because of the power of this campaign. And the narrators are actually two of our former students who went on to become lead organizers on this campaign. So, 
see if I can get this working. Someone want to get the lights in the back? Car washes, you know, unfortunately are much like uh, sweatshops on street corners. Um, many of the same conditions you saw in turn of the century garment factories um, are alive uh, and un unfortunately flourishing in today's car washes. So the car wash industry in Los Angeles um, consists of about 500 different uh, car washes. Uh, the workforce is pretty large, it's 10,000 workers. These are mostly immigrant Latino workers. Yo tengo, tengo cuatro hijos, entonces, pues la verdad, estaban estudiando los cuatro, y pues ya no me alcanzaba a mí para, para, este, para sostenerlos, y decidí venirme para acá. Nos sentíamos impresionados, eh, no teníamos apoyo de nada, algunos compañeros se golpearon, no teníamos apoyo ni médico ni nada porque el manager decía que, que, que no, que nosotros, él los hacía como que nosotros no, no éramos trabajadores importantes. I think most of us would be surprised at just how toxic the chemicals are in, in car washes. Uh, workers regularly use sulfuric acid to clean the rims of, of tires. Cuando uno le pone a los rines, el ácido, el ácido, si usted no ve el mascarilla, el ácido se le va a los pulmones, porque el ácido está bien fuerte y lo hace hasta vomitar. Bueno, a nosotros, yo, a mí me hacía vomitar, a una compañera también le hacía vomitar el ácido, porque está muy fuerte. El comedor no tiene refrigeración, tiene esponjas con las que lavan los carros, tiene, tiene botellas donde hay químicos de carros, Hay, hay depósitos de agua, donde hay agua sumamente sucia, que, que tiene mal olor. Este es el jabón que revienta los dedos. Hay un jabón verde, que ese jabón verde, con tantito que le cayera, le quemaba las manos. Este es el área donde trabajan y lavan los carros. Es un lugar muy peligroso y no adecuado como para tener un lonche. Many workers on the street, physical abuse, especially being a woman car wash worker. Thank you. 
So, um, let's turn off the. Uh, <laughs> um, so, the other thing that's really exciting about that. Uh, video is that um, we show it to our students to impress upon them how they can make a difference, that they can actually make change. And so uh, it was our students at UCLA that did the path-breaking research that uh, lifted the veil behind this industry, exposed the sweatshop conditions. It was our students that developed the reports that were used by members of the California State Legislature to change policy. Uh, it was our students who met with members of the LA City Council to pass resolutions in support of the car wash workers. And it was our students, upon graduating from UCLA, who got jobs as organizers uh, in this campaign. So uh, uh, Betsy Estudillo and Chloe Osmer were both graduates. Uh, one got her master's degree in social work, one got her master's degree in public policy. They were two of the lead organizers of this campaign. Many of our students were featured in the video uh, who are carrying the pickets and wearing the car wash t-shirts. Um, and uh, uh, they played a really essential role in, in building this uh, very powerful and successful campaign. Just two weeks ago, we had an open house for a new car wash worker center in um, South Los Angeles. And, uh, it's a, it's a great hall, and uh, it's a place where car wash workers from both the successfully organized car washes, but those who want to organize other car washes can meet, can gather. There is uh, a childcare space where they can bring their kids. There is an um, English language class for those who want to learn uh, more English. There is a computer lab. So there's many other ways that we can engage students in supporting uh, the organizing that's going on within the uh, car wash industry in Los Angeles. And as I indicated, there are um, now organizing campaigns that have been launched both in Chicago and New York based on the success of the uh, Los Angeles uh, campaign. I also wanted to talk about how the success in immigrant worker organizing in Los Angeles has also directly contributed to the transformation of the political scene in Los Angeles and throughout California. And I know this is something that, uh, that is a huge challenge that we face here in Wisconsin and in many other parts of the country in terms of uh, the danger of getting very conservative right-wing elected officials who do great harm to uh, the basic rights of workers. And, uh, that can only be challenged through successful labor community alliances and labor community partnerships to change the political culture. And so what we saw in Los Angeles, and again, I wanted to credit my good friend Miguel Contreras, who was the head of the labor movement for many years, who put into motion a transformational political mobilization program that changed politics in Los Angeles and in California. We are fortunate in California to have a relatively progressive uh, 
state house, a relatively progressive group of elected officials in uh, the state. But it hasn't always been that way. And in fact, um, California, you know, was the state that elected Ronald Reagan governor before he became president, that elected Richard Nixon governor before he became president. So we are not, we have not historically been this, you know, bastion of progressive thought if you can produce, you know, the Nixons and Reagans of the world. Um, but in Los Angeles, after the success of some of these path-breaking campaigns that were led by janitors, they were led by hotel workers, they were led by garment workers, Miguel <coughs> Contreras and the Los Angeles County labor movement challenged unions to change the way they do political work. And um, he said that historically, unions have existed like an ATM machine for elected officials. That elected officials come in with their card, they put their card in the machine, and they take out the money. And uh, what Miguel Contreras said is that the best resource of unions is not our money, because we are always outspent 10 to 1 by corporations. The power of unions is our membership and our ability to mobilize our members. And uh, that's what the corporations don't have. They have lots of money, they have lots of power, they don't have members. And if unions can effectively mobilize our base, mobilize our members to take action, we will win because numbers will always trump money. So what he did is that he set up a program that would recruit some of the best organizers fresh from these campaigns that where they had successfully won and built unions. And he got the best organizers from these organizing campaigns and put them into a training program to become political mobilizers. And he fundamentally changed the culture of the Los Angeles labor movement where it wasn't just a situation where a few union staff would do political mobilization and turnout. That if you were a leader, if you were a shop steward, if you were an activist, if you had any role within your union, you were expected to campaign. You were expected to do the phone banks. You were expected to knock on doors. You were expected to do the precinct walks. And uh, he mobilized all of the union leaders of Los Angeles, and he set up a program whereby the very best recently mobilized organizers were bought off from their jobs during election season to work full time as campaigners. So literally hundreds of the top <coughs> union organizers who had just won their union fights were now mobilizing their communities and especially targeting working class communities, communities of color that have historically had low vote voter turnout and successfully ramping up in a big way voter participation in communities of color and working class communities. And so even undocumented immigrant workers who had just won the janitors campaign, who had just won the hotel workers, who had just won the garment workers fight, even though they themselves can't vote, they can mobilize others within their communities who can vote. And so the culture has shifted to Los Angeles where now any campaign season, you cannot find a parking space in any of the major unions that are doing voter mobilization and voter turnout. And even the Chamber of Commerce recognizes that unions have much more power than any other force out there when it comes to campaigns and have marshaled an army of workers to support pro-labor candidates. So that was really the decisive turning point in terms of what changed California from a purple state that was kind of on the border of being red and blue to a solid blue state. And so um, the very campaigns that the LA labor movement was responsible for have completely flipped the political composition in California. Antonio Villaraigosa, who just uh, served as mayor for eight years in Los Angeles, was a former organizer of the teachers union in Los Angeles. The current speaker of the California State Assembly, John Perez, 
was an organizer with the United Food and Commercial Workers. Miguel's political director, Fabian Nunez, uh, ran for the first time for assembly. He'd never run for office before. He got elected. Within two years, he was speaker of the California State Assembly, the second most powerful position in the state of California. Uh, the LA County labor movement went out on a limb and fought the Democratic Party establishment to support Hilda Solis in her bid for Congress. And Hilda Solis was going up against a moderate Democrat. And the entire National Democratic Party establishment had a fit because they said you were breaking with tradition. It is wrong for labor to be going up against a moderate Democrat who was voted with us most of the time. And what Miguel Contreras said was that voting with us most of the time is not good enough. If we're going to be electing people, we, want, we don't want business Democrats. We don't want moderate Democrats who vote with us some of the time. We want warriors for working people. And so he took on the Democratic Party establishment. They supported Hilda Solis for Congress. She won that campaign, and she went on to become U.S. Secretary of Labor under the first Obama administration. So um, Karen Bass was recruited by labor to uh, run for office. She was the first African-American speaker of the California State Assembly. She is now in Congress. Uh, and the list goes on and on in terms of the success that labor has had in recruiting and electing some of the most progressive leaders in the country, in California. And just last November, there were two really critical ballot initiatives, Proposition 30 and Proposition 32. Proposition 30 was the very first progressive taxation initiative which successfully won and now billions of dollars have been restored to the California public school system as a result of that victory, in spite of fierce opposition from the right wing. And Prop 32 was a right wing sponsored ballot initiative which was going to gut the ability of unions to participate in the political process. And um, uh, it was a paycheck deception initiative that would try to strip the uh, ability of unions to use uh, political dues, uh, dues for political mobilizations. And this was clearly put up by corporations to punish unions for being so successful in uh, winning these campaigns in California. And that was uh, resoundingly defeated in the polls last November. So we won Prop 30, billions of new dollars in, uh, for public education in California, and we defeated Prop 32, a very direct attack on union power in the state of California. So um, I share this with you because what's very important to understand is that the organizing victories that have been won have also been parlayed into political victories. And that when you inspire and mobilize and organize workers to take action, they can take action whether it's in the organizing arena at the work site, but they can also take action in the political sphere when it comes to running and winning campaigns to elect pro-labor candidates. So um, I wanted to just wrap up by highlighting the changes that we have seen from 1999 when the AFL-CIO convention was held in Los Angeles last time where uh, day laborers were physically ejected from the convention, where uh, there was a huge debate on the convention floor with regard to immigrant rights that uh, successfully led to a transformation of policy uh, by the FLCIO with regard to um, immigrant rights. And that today, the FLCIO is at the forefront of advocating for immigration reform. My good friend Miguel Contreras tragically passed away back in 2006, uh, but his wife, Maria Elena Durazo, is now the leader of the Los Angeles labor movement, the first woman, the first woman of color ever to lead the uh, labor movement in Los Angeles. She was formerly um, president of the hotel workers, and she initiated some of the most far-sighted organizing campaigns in Los Angeles when she was leader of the hotel workers. So Maria Elena not only is the leader of the LA labor movement, she's the vice president of the National AFL-CIO, and she's also the chair of the National Immigration Committee. So she is spearheading labor's efforts to secure immigration reform. Uh, as we speak. And it's a very fierce and brutal fight. Uh, it looks like the House is doing everything they can to block 
uh, immigration reform from uh, moving forward. They're doing their best they can to shut down the federal government as we speak. Um, but I think that the time for immigration reform is now. And regardless of whether they can block it in this legislative session or the next, we are going to win immigration reform. It is not a question of if, it is a question of when. And if you look at the power and energy of the immigrant workers movement in this country, uh, we know that similar to the civil rights movement, it took many, many years to strike down some of these uh, very horrendous punitive laws which marginalized um, African Americans within our society. And similarly, with the 11 million undocumented immigrants who are stripped of basic rights within our society, that we know that it's only a matter of time that um, this fight will prevail as well. So the AFL-CIO convention was marked by uh, a major emphasis on support for immigrant rights. Uh, the AFL-CIO convention was also marked by an embrace of new forms of worker organization. And so uh, many of the immigrant worker centers were prominently featured at the AFL-CIO convention. So you had the day laborers who 14 years ago had been physically ejected, now they were up on stage making presentations. You had the domestic workers who were celebrated. They were given the Human Rights Award by the AFL-CIO. And domestic workers from many parts of the world were represented at the convention, and they marched into the convention floor singing, uh, women from all over the world who were domestic workers. And in New York, they successfully passed a Domestic Workers Bill of Rights in California. Uh, we are very close to having the governor sign a, a version of the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. Um, in the election of officers, for the very first time, the executive director of a worker center was elected to the FLCI Executive Council, the executive director of the National Taxi Workers Alliance. Uh, the first time ever a worker center is now represented at the top leadership of the FLCIO. And my good friend Tafari Gabre, who was the former leader of the Orange County Labor Federation, the county adjacent to Los Angeles, he was elected executive vice president, one of the top three officers within the AFL-CIO. And this is history making. Not only is Tafari a powerful visionary leader who has helped to transform the labor movement in Orange County, he's the first immigrant and the first African immigrant to ever be an officer within the AFL-CIO. And so it was so exciting to watch him be elected and be celebrated at the AFL-CIO convention. The reality is that these are still extremely difficult times for the U.S. labor movement. And for those of you in Wisconsin, you know that reality better than anybody else. But at the same time, what we see coming out of this AFL-CIO convention and what we see in terms of the successful organizing campaigns that have been fought and won in California is that there is hope for the future. And if the American labor movement can transform the way they do their work, if they can transform the way they organize, strengthen labor community partnerships, reach out to workers who have historically been excluded by the American labor movement, I think that there is hope for a new and a better day. I just wanted to conclude by saying that one of the major challenges that was put out at the AFL-CIO convention in Los Angeles is that the American labor movement can no longer exist as an exclusive club. And the reality is that in America today, anyone can join the Tea Party, anyone can join the National Rifle Association, but anyone can't join the American labor movement. Only if you are fortunate enough to be in a collective bargaining agreement can you be a member of the AFL-CIO. And that's really a huge structural weakness that we have to challenge and confront. That all of the statistics and studies reflect that the majority of American workers would join a union today if given the opportunity to do so. But the reality is that the vast majority of workers can't do so because they are not in a place where there is an active organizing campaign that will lead to a collective bargaining agreement. 
So there is something fundamentally flawed with this current situation where the majority of workers would join a union if given the opportunity, but the AFL-CIO and structurally our unions have not figured out a way to open the doors of the American labor movement to workers throughout the country who would like to join but are not given the opportunity to do so. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Yeah, I would, I would, has anybody talked about the IWW, the one big union which had exactly those characteristics that you just found lacking? I'm just curious. Um, I've done study about the IWW, and I've also done study about the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which had a much more open policy with regard to membership and aggressively reaching out and recruiting immigrants, people of color, women. Um, and so I think that we really need to reevaluate as a labor movement our policies of admission and our policies of membership. And a follow-up? Please. Is there any discussion about uh, labor unions having other than wages, hours, and working conditions as their focus? Because the European broad unions seem to be far more effective in holding down corporate abusers than we are. Very much so, and that was part of the discussion that emerged in Los Angeles, that labor has to be part of a much broader social justice movement, and that it is important that labor, of course, take on our immediate fights at the workplace for wages and benefits, but to represent the interests of the entire working class, it's also important that we take on broader issues that confront workers regardless of their union membership. Questions, please. Uh, yeah, thank you for a great talk. It was, it was, uh, it was very moving. No, no, no pun intended. But, uh, I, uh, um, given your work in California and the work of others in the union movement, uh, has California been able to uh, reverse the trend of declining unionization rates? Uh, I was wondering if California you know, has kind of shown the way, uh, the way to do it. In the year 2012, union membership actually increased by over 100,000 in the state of California. Um, Los Angeles and California are above the national um, union density rates. Um, and you know there are significant increases in certain sectors. Um, the reality, however, is that the majority of unions, even in California, are continuing to lose members and to decline. So uh, I think what's really important is to identify and look at the unions that are growing and to evaluate and analyze why that is happening and how that could be emulated throughout the rest of the labor movement. Yes? Yeah, um, so according, uh, I have a question for each of you. According to your narrative, it seems that the um, 1999 convention it represents like an important shift, especially at the moment in which uh, a migrant, I mean, I don't remember her name, his name, no? Miguel Contreras, uh, yes. Exactly, uh, Miguel Contreras uh, was uh, elected as a main, main leader. So what would you say organizationally allowed for that change to occur within your position? Like some more internal politics uh, dynamics that might help explain what made it possible at that moment where, you know, very recently there was a lot of protection. That's a very good question. And I think that in any arena, it's critical to develop a coalition of the willing. It's critical to galvanize and to work with and to partner with those individuals, those unions, those organizations that are willing to make change. And so what happened is that in Los Angeles, what we saw is that there were two major unions that really stood out and began to change the way that unions did their work. One was the work of the hotel workers under the leadership of Maria Elena Dorazo, who is now the leader of the LA labor movement. And the other was the Justice for Janitors campaign. And um, I was staff attorney at the Service Employees Union at the time when both the janitors campaign and the home care workers campaign were launched. And so I saw firsthand what was going on. And it required 
an abrupt change in the way that unions did their work. The reality is that the majority of unions in this country very much embrace a business union model where they view running a union like running any other business, that we take care of our members, uh, we service them, we file their grievances, we negotiate contracts on our behalf, and um, they give us dues, and that's the way it works. Uh, the social justice union model sees that it's the members that must take control of the union organization. It's the members that have to uh, step up to the plate and to assume leadership of these working class institutions and that the only way that we're going to be able to improve the lives of not just our own members but workers in general is through organizing and building political power. There's no other way we're going to do it. And so if you embrace a service model where you're taking care of people and if you're existing as an ATM machine for politicians, you're not going to change, you're not going to win. And so those two unions, the Service Employees Union, Justice for Janitors Campaign, and the Hotel Worker Organizing started doing things that no one else in LA had done in many, many years. They'd done it back in the 30s, but they kind of forgot about that. And so the hotel workers and the janitors started doing civil disobedience, and they started using nonviolence, and they started staging building takeovers and blocking streets. And a lot of times when you do those types of things, people don't like it. <laughs> they get offended, and they are inconvenienced, and they get pissed off. Well, why are you blocking the street during rush hour? Why are you messing with my, you know, uh, my rush hour commute? And it's very important in the course of these campaigns that you develop comprehensive campaigns, that you develop a clear message and say, look, we are stopping traffic today because this building owner is a sweatshop owner and is violating the law and is ripping off his workers. And we need to call the public's attention to why this is unacceptable in Los Angeles in this day and age. And uh, you have to sometimes engage in nonviolent civil disobedient protest to disrupt the status quo. Because the status quo is not working for working people in this country. And so if you think that you can play by the rules and abide by the law, the laws are stacked against us. So it was really the models that were being tested by the hotel workers and the janitors that started a new energy in the labor movement. So when Miguel Contreras became leader of the LA labor movement, those were really the two major unions <coughs> that he partnered with to de develop this change agenda. And so when the Justice for Janitors, when the hotel workers started doing all this crazy stuff, you know, like blocking streets and civil disobedience and taking over hotels, and you know, then other union activists and other unions said, wow, they can do that there. We can do that here. And so it, it changed the dynamic where uh, other union leaders were starting to say, if they can do that, I can do that. If they can mobilize their members, if they can take action like that, so can I. And so it does develop a new paradigm shift. And it develops a new culture of organizing and social justice unionism that is infectious because <laughs> workers want to win. Workers don't want to just get beaten down and exploited and abused all the time. They want to fight and they want to win. But you have to show them that there is a way that we can win. And that's what the janitors did. That's what the hotel workers did. And through building that into a political movement as well, everybody won. Because then we didn't have to put up with these business Democrats who, you know, I mean, so many Democrats get just as much contributions from corporations because they do the same as you know, the Republicans in terms of their tax policies in terms of their, uh, their opposition to labor law reform, in terms of their opposition to any number of social justice initiatives. So it's not enough to elect moderate Democrats. We need to change that. So that was really the lesson of the transformation of Los Angeles, that you're never going to get 
the majority of people or the majority of unions to just make that change all at once. You have to build a coalition of the willing and you have to show through a positive model that, that we can fight and that we can change. Yes? Yeah. Uh, thanks, first of all, Ken, for injecting some optimism. Into, as, as many of us are aware, it's often a doom and gloom portrayal of the situation for labor. So it's good to be reminded of some of the positive stuff. And I want to address some of your concluding remarks about the broadening and opening up of the labor movement to different constituencies. And as you know, I, we, I, I was also in LA for the convention, so I was there for that, those resolutions. And, and it does seem like some exciting developments. And you know, I agree that you know, with the state of labor law, um, it's kind of, we're in a ridiculous situation with, in terms of blocking people's ability to join the labor movement, and we need to figure out ways. The question, though, is that the, as you said, you know, anybody can join the NRA, anyone can join the CR club, or so on and so forth. But there's a crucial difference between those kind of groups and, and, and labor unions, which is that labor unions are agents of democracy in the workplace. Fundamentally, labor unions de derive their power from being able to exercise some sort of power in the workplace. And I would like to hear your ideas on how you think this new open uh, openness to new constituencies can actually help people sort of inject that control over the workplace in places where they don't necessarily have official NLRB certified collective bargaining rights. Or, you know, because from, I mean, I'm not sure that this isn't part of the plan, but I, you know, it seems like a lot of what we've been seeing with Working America and so on and so forth is sort of trying to create a sort of interest group lobbying arm of labor, which, you know, isn't necessarily a horrible thing, but sort of isn't quite the same thing as what sort of rebuilding a labor movement is about. Well, that's a great question, and these are threshold issues, yeah. so I don't have all of the answers to how do we see an expanded vision of the American labor movement. What I do see, however, is that we have gone from a situation 50 years ago where 35% of the American workforce was unionized to today it is 11%, and it is 7% in the private sector. Yeah. So if we continue to do exactly what we've been doing for the last 50 years, we are going to ensure our extinction. You know, that's like no brainer. Like, if you look at 50 year trajectory, if we continue to do exactly what we've been doing for the last 50 years, you know, like, you can, you can start digging our graves. Mm -hmm. So the challenge then is that how do we use this crisis of the American labor movement to envision a new day. And what is going on in America today? Is it because workers are so well paid that they don't need unions? Is it because uh, we've addressed the issue of uh, the safety net and we've secured you know, a living wage and we've secured benefits for the working class? Is that we have eradicated racism and eradicated anti-immigrant exploitation? Is it because we have gender equality? Is it because uh, you know uh, the wage differential and the wealth differential is you know uh, becoming less and less? No. The the problems facing the American labor movement are facing the entire working class, and indeed, the decline in union density hurts all workers, regardless of whether they're in a union or not, because. It's precisely those industries which have no union presence at all, like the garment industry, like fast foods, where exploitation is the worst, you know? Uh, and it's in those industries where we still have some union density that workers still have a say. So absolutely, we want to defend collective bargaining rights. We want to defend a, a democratic role for workers at the workplace where we can fight and secure collective bargaining agreements, but if you look at the 50-year trajectory, if we think that one-by-one one collective bargaining agreements is going to reverse the decline of the American labor movement, we're fooling ourselves. And if we think that the vast majority of resources of the American labor movement, which continue to be allocated towards servicing a, dimin a diminishing sector of the U.S. workforce, 
And you know, if we're spending 90% of our resources on 11% of the working class, and less than 10% of our resources on the 90% of the working class, then we're sealing our own doom. So how do we change that? And how do we build a culture of organizing and political power that will align unions with our natural allies? And there are many. If you look at what the Occupy movement was able to accomplish on a shoestring budget, they flipped the whole narrative. They took on the Tea Party and said that we are the 99%. And what's wrong with this picture when all of the wealth that has been generated in this country has gone to the top 1%? What's wrong with this picture? Now, Occupy didn't have the solution and didn't have a sustainable movement to move beyond kind of that you know, headline. But it reflects that they were able to tap into a deep resentment by the vast majority of working people in this country who know they're getting screwed, who know that, that US corporations are not working in our interests, that uh, all the wealth is being concentrated in the hands of a few, and that there is something fundamentally wrong with the direction of our society. So how do we begin to tap into that sentiment, and how do we begin to launch constructive social justice movements that will make change? So the immigrant rights fight is a clear example of that. This is a powerful fight that labor is now on the right side of history. And labor is taking a very important role in leading this fight. 11 million people, 11 million people who are living in an apartheid-like existence where they have no rights, they have no protections, where, you know, with E-Verify, they have a situation where Immigrant workers cannot even go to the police. If you are a victim of a crime, if you are being beaten by your husband, if you are a victim of domestic violence, you can't go to a cop because they could turn over the information to immigration and you'd be deported tomorrow. You'd be torn from your family. So what is wrong with this picture? You know, 11 million people who are contributing every day to our economy. You know, it is 11 million people who are caring for our kids, caring for our elderly, planting and picking the fruits and vegetables that we eat every day, serving the food at our restaurants, cleaning the hotel rooms. This is the 11 million people that are an integral part of our society and our economy, and yet they are being ruthlessly attacked by the forces of capital. And everybody talks about how the immigration system is broken. It's actually not broken at all. It's working very, very well for those in power who are using the marginal status of 11 million people to exacerbate contradictions within the working class and to extract super profits from undocumented immigrants who are getting ripped off every day. So it's working very well for those in power. That's what the immigration laws were designed for. We have to challenge the existing labor laws in this society which were racist in their formation, which excluded domestic workers, excluded farm workers because those were industries where workers of color dominated. So the National Labor Relations Act deliberately kept out farm workers because of African workers in the South and Latino workers in the fields of California, deliberately kept out domestic workers, and by law are not eligible to join a union. So should the American labor movement respect that law? Well, sorry, we can't organize domestic workers. You can't join a collective bargaining agreement. Therefore, you can't be part of our club. That's what we've been telling people for 50 years. Sorry, domestic workers. Sorry, taxi cab workers. Sorry, farm workers. You can't, you can't join us. Do, do the immigrant workers hear about the IWW? Do they know about the IWW? I, I mean, it seems to me there's a model. Well, at one point, I think that the IWW was a model for some people. But let's be real in terms of IWW capacity, staff, membership. Does the IWW leadership reflect the d diversity of the American working class? Do we have IWW organizers in all these immigrant communities? And why isn't there just one big union of immigrants? Why don't they form a one big union of immigrants so that everybody has a union card, whether or not they have a job, and they can act like the IWW? Well, the reality is that there are 200 immigrant worker centers all over the country 
who are doing the work that the labor movement has not done. So there are 200 immigrant worker centers, the National Day Labor Organizing Network, the Restaurant Opportunity Center, the uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance, the National Guest Workers Alliance. There are over 200 immigrant worker organizations that should be directly aligned with the American labor movement. And so what the convention in Los Angeles reflected is a growing consensus of the necessity of broadening the scope of the American labor movement to include our allies. And to reject this assumption that if you're not among the lucky 11% who are currently in a union, then you're not organized. The reality is that there are many other forms of worker organization that exist outside of the American labor movement that we need to connect with, work with, and partner with. So that is our challenge. Yes? Uh, so you talked about immigration reform. What's your opinion on the current one that's, up, that's being um, presented right now? And uh, beyond that, kind of, if you know, what is like the, the union kind of opinion on it? There is not one union opinion on it. Yeah. Uh, the reality is that, in my view, immigration reform is not happening in this congressional term. You know, we are now rounding out the month of September. We have a couple months left in this congressional session. And the Tea Party are much more committed to shutting down the federal government than doing anything uh, meaningful that would enact some type of change agenda. So I think that the chances of anything getting out of this house are uh, abysmal. At the same time, I think that if you look at the history of the civil rights movement and the history of social justice movement in this country, we can't wait for Congress to act. And, uh, and we need to mobilize in unprecedented ways uh, immigrant communities. And my talk tomorrow will focus much more on immigration reform and the immigrant youth movement because in my view, uh, the work of the immigrant youth movement has really set a vision for the future and immigrant <coughs> youth have done what no one else in the immigrant rights movement has been able to do, and that has secured a tangible victory from the Obama administration in uh, the enactment of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA. And that was a, a huge victory for the immigrant youth movement, who were in many ways opposed by the leaders of the immigrant rights movement in this country. So uh, any, any of you want to hear more about that, come to my talk tomorrow. What time is it? Four o'clock. Same, same room? No, no across, across the way. The across the street, four o'clock tomorrow. Be there. Room 8417. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, I just had a, um, a quick question. First up, uh, I just want to say, I want to thank you for all that you did with Peace Valley. I'm a, a product of uh, the undergraduate education, and um, I took Lena Moss's class and I joined local 11M's part all of the right. um, Justice for Downers. That's, That's great. Day. That's great. That, those were, were exciting really, times. Yeah, they were intense. To be right, and, you know, we were in a class. And, you know, we had to join local eleven and have a management as part of our uh, to get a day. <laughs> um, and the new Tony Camp, you know, yeah. So, um, and I also got I got my car wash at Union Wash at Vermont and All right, and wonderful. Right there. Um, I I just kind of wanted to ask because first I really appreciate your comment about the fact that union is not necessarily the only kind of structural kind of organization for. Right. And, and a lot of the things that's been laid out in terms of strategy, in terms of having a broad-based coalition. But I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, um, you know, when you talk about broadening the membership, because how, how is the American Labor Union, or how the AFL-CAO is really actually dealing with the D.C. like the phobic and race potential within the labor movement that's actually causing, right? So outside of just structurally not allowing people into it, I think there's deep-seated sympathy towards um, foreign workers, right, or immigrant workers that I think um, is still at the heart of, you know, what if the reform, immigration reform is kind of about. I mean, what are some steps that have been taken internally to actually address these more deep-seated deep issues, right? The reality is, you know, the labor movement is a big tent. 
and there are workers from all over the country from many, many different backgrounds, from many, many different experiences, city, states, rural, urban. And like the workforce overall, there's a lot of prejudice. There's sexism, there's racism, there's anti-immigrant sentiment, there's homophobia. It's all there. It's, it's in our society. How, how could it not be in the labor movement? It's in society at large. I think that in many ways there's much less in the labor movement than in society at large because of core values and principles that sisters and brothers in the labor movement adhere to. So I do think that this whole culture of an injury to one is an injury to all and that in order to win together, we have to fight together, we have to stand together, we have to organize together. And um, I think that I've seen, even in the last 14 years, a huge transformation with regard to the majority of workers in unions who now support immigration reform. That's a sea change from 14 years ago, where the majority of union members in this country support immigration reform. That was not the case 14 years ago. But part of that is an ongoing educational process. And the way people get educated is in the course of struggle. That's the best way that people understand what this is all about. So it had a huge impact during the Justice for Janitors campaign when workers throughout LA saw janitors getting beaten by the LAPD in Century City, where dozens were sent to the hospital. One woman suffered a miscarriage as a result of the beating by the LA Police Department. And what was their crime? Their crime was they were standing up to demand a union. And so many, even within my own union, SEIU, the day after, we were afraid that the janitors weren't going to come back. My God, you know, we hadn't won the campaign. We've been working for years and years to try to organize. They're beaten by the police. They're threatened with deportation. One woman suffered a miscarriage. And the next day, hundreds of janitors came back and said, we're not going away. You know, we are fighting until we win. And that impressed workers all over LA. When they saw that, oh my God, you know, like immigrant janitors, they don't have a union, they're getting beaten, and they're willing to come back and fight. You know, even union members of LA who had questions about immigration, had questions about whether we should let these people who don't speak English into my union, they were inspired by their courage. Same thing with the car wash workers. You know, it's like uh, these workers have nothing. They're risking everything. They're risking arrest and deportation, challenging their bosses in front of their own workplaces. And is that something that other union members can learn from? You know? And you know, the fact that Hilda Solis, the first group of workers that she met with when she was Secretary of Labor, she came to Los Angeles to meet with the car wash workers. You know, the fact that now, whenever you say carabacheros, which is the new Spanglish term for car wash workers in Los Angeles, people erupt in applause because it means that they're fighting back and they're winning. You know, during the Justice or Janitors strike, when janitors throughout the city were wearing these bright red t-shirts with a clenched fist holding a mop that said Justice for Janitors, that hundreds of thousands of people in LA supported them. When we had a march down Wilshire Boulevard, office workers were holding signs saying, we support the janitors. I mean, office workers who had never been in a union in their lives were coming and putting $20 bills in the donation can because they saw that the janitors were standing up for them. I you remember know? tents. I remember reporting on tents. You put tents on the street and in many, many, many cities that you went through just like uh, people don't see tents in the middle of downtown Los Angeles very often. It's true. So, so the challenge is people learn in the course of struggle and people learn when other workers are stepping forward and fighting. And the car wash workers, you know, who would have thought that the steel workers would be organizing car wash workers? Steel workers, you know? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, steel workers. Not and too I've, many there anymore. What? Not too many there anymore. But what I was amazed is that you have, you know, 
the industrial workers, steel workers, coming out to LA to support the car wash workers. And as soon as these undocumented Latino immigrant workers put on their steel worker t-shirts, they became steel workers. <laughs> and there was this bond. And so Leo Gerard, you know, the president of the steel workers, comes to City Hall in LA and saying that, you know, the steel workers are 100% behind our sisters and brothers in the car washes and we're gonna fight till we win, you know, so he's surrounded by Latino immigrant car wash workers with steel workers t-shirts and they are his union, you know? So I see that change and it, it is happening and it's not happening as fast as I would like it to see and it's not happening everywhere in the country, but when workers stand together and fight together, they win together. That's my, that's the lessons that I took from the farm workers and those are the lessons that I continue to take in uh, the battles that we see in Los Angeles. So, thank you very much.